In February 1945, the Allies hold a conference at Yalta. It's a triumphant Russia that greets Churchill and Roosevelt. Господин президент, господин премьер-министр, почетный караул, честь вашего прибытия, Союз Советских Социалистических Республик построен. Начальник почетного караула, старший лейтенант Казупеев. Together, the Allies planned the victory. Now, they must organize the peace, and that's even more difficult. Who will make the decisions? The big three alone. Churchill, the fighter. He has always mistrusted Stalin. His personal prestige is immense, but already the British Empire is cutting a relatively poor figure. It's no longer able to impose. It must persuade. Stalin, the Bolshevik. He is at the height of his power. All his life he's had to scheme and plot. Today, he is the strongest there. Roosevelt, the pacifist. He directs the most powerful country in the world, but he doesn't believe in force. About Germany, there is agreement. She will be demilitarized, denazified, and occupied. Thanks to Churchill, France will also have an occupied zone. The four powers will be at Berlin. For Europe, the bargaining is over. But what about Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary? It's agreed that they will be in the Soviet zone of influence. But for Poland and Czechoslovakia, the discussion is heated. After hours of negotiations, a compromise is reached temporarily. Roosevelt is satisfied. He has confidence in the future. But seeing his face ravaged by illness, everyone knows he has not long to live. Not long enough even to enjoy the victory. Stalin himself is very pleased. He seems to be thinking that the war isn't over yet. And the Soviet army continues to advance. On April the 16th, Zukov and Konyev take the offensive again and cross the ocean. In Berlin, two million inhabitants and a million refugees are terrified when they hear the news. The Russians have straddled the odor. They're as good as here. We will defend Berlin to the end, roars Goebbels over the radio. Fight relentlessly, fanatically. All men between 14 and 70 years of age, even the crippled and the sick, are enrolled in the Volkssturm, the people's militia. For your women, for your children, for your mothers, the Führer has said. There are not enough guns. No matter. Everyone will receive a miraculous weapon. And with this, each Berliner, man, woman or child, will destroy his Russian tank.
Germany, says the Führer, is going to save Europe from the hordes of Central Asia. In the West, five American armies invade Germany. After crossing the Rhine, the Americans discover a pile of ruins. There's nothing but a facade. Certain units of the Wehrmacht resist the desperate enemy. It takes one division six days to take Asraffenburg, close to Mannheim. And each time, it's necessary to call on air support. For the German soldiers, there's no hope. Not anymore. Neither to the east, nor to the west. So why do they continue to fight as they do? Lieutenant von Kagenick, officer of an armed panzer division. When I look back on this era, 27 years ago, I see it like a dream, like a mad dream, like a nightmare. It was an ever-accelerating disaster, like a film which unrolls faster and faster. I remember the bombardment of Dusseldorf. I remember presenting a decoration to two of my sub-lieutenants who had received a very high decoration for bravery in the Battle of the Ardennes. I made another speech, extolling the good old traditions honor, pride, pride of a German officer, and reiterated the same stupid words. It is necessary to fight for the fatherland to the last drop of blood, to the end, to the last cartridge. And people believed it. Discipline was still very strict. Pressure on Germany grows ever increasingly and the most devoted believer begins to lose hope. Soon, even the good soldiers desert, one after the other. entire division surrendered. On April the 18th, the whole of Army Group B, a total of 317,000 men, is taken prisoner in a pocket of the room. German civilians begin to ask themselves, are the Americans, after all, conquerors or liberators? they were liberators, one could join with them against the Russians. General Garand even offers the ME-262 jets to the Americans. He sends one of his own pilots as intermediary, Major Wilhelm Herget. General Garand, Mademoiselle. General Garand asked me, Major Herget, will you try to speak to General Eisenhower? 
as you speak a little English. I said, yes, General, I will try. Je veux essayer. Il voulait proposer que tous les avions... He wanted to suggest that all the Messerschmitt Me-262s should fly, with the permission of the Americans, against Russia. Contre la Russie. J'ai pris le 2 mai un Fieslerstorch pour aller à Schleisheim. I took up a Fieslerstorch on May the 2nd to Schleisheim. I spoke to a general of the 45th Infantry Division there, and he spoke to General Eisenhower. ...de l'infanterie, et il a parlé avec General Eisenhower. What did the American reply? General Eisenhower... General Eisenhower said no. After that, the Luftwaffe was finished. On the motorway from Frankfurt to Nuremberg, the American 7th Army under General Patch advances in giant strides. This is Hitler's triumphal way, which leads to the sanctuary of Nazism, Nuremberg. But Nuremberg is in ruins. Frenetic Nazis once acclaimed their Führer here. The Third Army liberates Buchenwald. A horrified Patton asks Eisenhower to come and see it for himself. Never in my life, in any circumstances, said Eisenhower, have I had such a shock. desolate countryside, the communal ditches. The Americans are discovering in that place of horror all that was possible in Nazi Germany. We didn't know about it, wailed the Germans. Well, go and see. Get inside. Look at the crematorial ovens. Look at the piles of burnt. First French army, having cleaned up the Black Forest, stretches across Germany to the Rhine and the Danube. The second divisional brigade goes as far as Berchtesgaden. The French first army takes Freiburg, then Stuttgart. Stuttgart, which is in the American operational zone. Truman protests to de Gaulle, who replies, here I am, here I stay. 28,000 German prisoners replace the liberated French prisoners in the prison camps. For five years they waited for this day, never doubting 
that they would be freed by French soldiers. Moving from one chateau to another, the Vichy government has been operating from Sigmaringen on the Danube. But Pétain and Laval have separated. Pétain is in Switzerland and Laval in Spain by the time the 5th Armoured Division arrives on April the 22nd. The second, waiting impatiently in France, demands to be in at the kill. On April the 29th, Leclerc comes into Germany with one idea at the back of his mind, to capture Hitler's lair at Berchtesgaden. Officer Cadet Jean Raison. It was victory. It was the end, the end of a long road, of a ride that we had taken for the oldest among us since the Sahara, into the heart of Nazism. We all hoped and believed it, and truly all the world had done its best towards it. One was even afraid at any given moment of the possibility of armistice. On the 4th of May, the spearhead of the 2nd took Berchtesgarten railway station. Behind a bit, close to the square, you see this train. We found the train completely closed. Sticking our noses in, as usual, some of us went to look inside. To our amazement, we found it stuffed with provisions, wines, pictures, all sorts of treasures. It was Göring's train. In the other chaos of Germany in 1945, he had been moving his possessions from Karin Hall to Berchtesgaden. With the loot that Göring has pillaged all across Europe, from the churches, from the museums, the Cranachs, the Rembrandts, the Renoirs, the Manet. And ingots of gold, tons of gold. Captain Tuera is the first to enter the Berghof, Hitler's villa above the town. He precedes Officer Cadet Raison. It's here exactly. This is where Hitler's villa was. You can only see the foundations, the ruins. There's not much left. Hitler had abandoned his villa, the ruins of his home, symbolic of all that was happening in Germany. The villa had been prepared for extraordinary events. Escape corridors ran through multi-level basements, which were protected by special defense posts equipped with automatic weapons. The occupants had left hurriedly, and only the debris of the master's possessions remained. No one had stayed to salvage the treasures accumulated by the conqueror of Europe. No faithful servant remained behind to greet the new occupant. The Allied troops moved through the house as if it were haunted. General Leclerc came to the spot the morning after, at about half past nine. He came up to us with his general staff, to Captain Tuera and me. He looked at this villa. He didn't bother with trifles, the general. He didn't go into the Berghof. That didn't interest him. What did interest him was to have led his division, as he had led them since the outset, since 1940, and to have arrived here to raise the French flag on the house of Hitler himself at the Berghof. It was a big flag, blue, white and red. He expressed his satisfaction to us. I remember for the photo of the officer cadets, the senior officers were also in the picture. He said to me, ah, the officer cadet, here. And if there was one there whom he wanted, whom he thought highly of, he was a lucky man. So far, so good, General Leclerc said to his men. But we must go up there, to the nest of the eagle, where Hitler felt he dominated the world. With men of the Chad Infantry Battalion, Tuera and Raison take five hours to scale the rock 
and at 6.30 p.m. they plant the flag of free France. Uh, it was a, an enormous room, very pretty, with a great fireplace and a magnificent view. The cloth was laid on the table. We discussed it, and I must confess that, well, we took a few things. This is what I found and hid for 27 years at the bottom of my chest of drawers. You see the monogram, A.H. Why did I take this and not the others? Well, that's how it was. We were rushed. A serviette, this serviette which was part of a table set, A.H., and the big tablecloth. I put it in my belt too. It replaced the flag. La grande nappe, je l'ai emmenée aussi dans le ceinturon. Elle a remplacé le drapeau. Throughout Germany, events move at breakneck speed. On April the 25th, the tanks of the American First Army reach the Elbe at Torgau. At midday, a patrol of the 69th American Division meets the first Russian soldiers of the 58th Guards Division. In 24 hours, Torgau, an obscure little market town in Saxony, has become celebrated throughout the entire world. War correspondents, photographers, cameramen gather to record the historic event. The handshake between the American general, Emil Reinhardt, and the Soviet general, Vladimir Rusakov. The handshake between East and West. While the American and Russian soldiers are fraternizing on the banks of the Elbe, in San Francisco, the first conference of the United Nations is taking place. President Truman declares, we have fought together in war. Now, we shall work together for peace. The troops are only too pleased to drink to that. In the north, it's Britain's turn to meet up with the Russians. After taking Hamburg, they close ranks near Wismar on the Baltic. They don't understand each other, and it's not just a question of language. How are you, pal? You're one of Joe Stalin's soldiers, and I'm pleased to meet you. We've both come a long way together, and we've done it together. What does that mean? What does that mean? Hey? What does that mean? I don't know. Indeed. I don't know. Well, we can't speak the lingo, but we can talk the same way together, can't we? Yes. Well, all the best, old man. I'm very, very glad to have met you. Very glad indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. We don't understand the language, but we mean the same thing. Don't be too sure about that. The handshake between Field Marshal Montgomery and Marshal Rokossovsky is a mere formality. Behind his polite smile, Montgomery hides inner frustration. If only they'd listen to him, he would already be in Berlin. And if we could beat the Russians to it, things would be much easier for us in the post-war years. But Eisenhower didn't agree. He reckoned that Berlin was merely a geographical location in which he wasn't interested. Well, we were to pay very dearly for that. On the other hand, for Marshal Zhukov and the whole Soviet army, the prize of Berlin is the principal objective. For two months, two million Russian soldiers have fretted impatiently 40 miles from Hitler's capital. On plans and scale models, the Soviet high command has studied the final assault. All the Russian generals realize that they will have to take the city district by district, street by street. Among them, 
General Balti. The day of preparation for the Battle of Berlin has arrived. Three parties of Russian armed forces, those of Rokossovsky, Zhukov and Konev, were engaged in the operation of Berlin. The troops of Marshal Zhukov were to carry out the mission of honor to remove the capital of the Reich. General, some historians claim that the other generals were jealous of this choice and that they claimed the honor. In particular, Marshal Konyev. Yes, no doubt that's true. On the 1st of April, the two marshals, Zhukov and Konyev, were invited to headquarters. Where Stalin himself sketched the border between the White Russian Front and the Ukraine Front. He had drawn them close to the town, Lubin. And that left the space to the west and to the south of Berlin empty. Let the best man win, in fact. Yes, in fact, that's how it happened. And the battle, the assault on Berlin, occurred on two fronts. Zhukov's and Konyev's. Konyev was now able to throw all his tanks on Berlin. On April the 25th, the capital was surrounded. Marshal Voronov had concentrated 22,000 heavy guns around the city, one every 30 feet. Soviet armies, four of them elite guards, and three assault formations attack all the suburbs of Berlin at the same moment. At Potsdam, at Spandau, and at Pankow, the 200,000 German soldiers of the garrison defend each ruin, cling to each section of wall. obvious that the battle for Berlin is going to prove costly, very costly. Each block turned into a fortress has to be raised by the Russian artillery. Two million civilians are caught in the trap. In the middle of this inferno was one woman, Frau Dubka. 
question dans, dans cette cave depuis trois jours. We were in this cellar for three days. One hardly went out at all. We piled one on top of the other, and one felt that it was all near, very near. And one had got used to the noise of the grenades, to the sound of everything falling. And one felt the impact of grenades exploding in all the gardens. One thought that really, it wouldn't be long. And then, it was so beautiful. And then I thought that, my God, I don't know. I don't want to end up in a cellar like that, unwashed, in the middle of people who haven't washed since I don't know how long. There was no more water. One had to look for it. And looking for water was a dangerous enterprise. Then I took my baby, who'd woken up, it was seven o'clock in the morning. And I went up into the kitchen. The cellar had a staircase which gave onto the kitchen. It was as close as this. And then I waited. I hadn't waited long when there were two, two soldiers who arrived with their machine guns pointed. And then, I couldn't even say I was afraid. I was rather curious. A whole pile of literary memories came back into my mind. It was doubtless because I was hungry. And then the two fellows were between 20 and 25 years old. Certainly not more. They were so dirty that it was difficult to say at least as dirty as I was. When they opened the door, my God, I don't know if they were much more confident than I was. Naturally, I didn't speak Russian. And then they had... It seemed silly. One of them smiled and pointed to the door which went to the cellar. Then I tried to make him understand that there were only women and one very old man. I don't know if he understood old man, but he understood there were women. Then he went down and the other one smiled and tried to make my baby laugh. The arrival of the first Soviet soldiers terrifies the Berliners. Many cannot stomach the idea and prefer to commit suicide. Entire families kill themselves. Survival becomes increasingly grim for the Berliners caught in the city. Carcasses are butchered in the street. All services are broken down and food is the most important consideration for these civilians trapped between the fighting armies. Water is even more precious than food, and people seek it everywhere, even in the drains. April the 26th, the second day of the attack. Zhukov's forces now clean up 600 blocks of houses, one by one.
the 27th of April, the 8th Army, under the command of Chukov, the hero of Stalingrad, seizes Temelhof Aerodrome, four miles from Hitler's Chancellery. April the 28th, this is all that remains of the Third Reich, which two years earlier stretched from Cap Nord to Africa, and from the Atlantic to the Caucasus, a six kilometer square of ruin. The Wehrmacht is no more. Only pockets of resistance, like the bunker at the zoo with his underground hospital, where 29,000 civilians hunched together in the dugouts with a handful of the faithful. Goebbels, some of the SS, some Hitler youth. For the last time, Hitler comes out of his hole. He is 56 years old. He has injections of strychnine six times a day. He knows that the game is over, but he wants Germany to collapse with him, to the last stone, to the last child. His only friend comes to say goodbye to him, Albert Speer. Hitler wasn't, was hardly living, really. He was almost dead. I had the impression that his reactions were not the reaction of a living man. They were the reactions of a man who is already on the other side. What did he say to you? Il m'a dit, um, he said to me, the war will be finished in a few days. I am going to commit suicide and I shall be very happy when things are over because I've suffered too many setbacks in the last months and the betrayal of my closest collaborators and now I shall be, I shall be free from all my cares. What did you think when you left him for the last time? It was, it was the same when I left him. I thought he would send greetings to my family, or perhaps that he would say to me that he would wish me luck, but he was as cold as ever. I think now that he was upset because I didn't want to stay in Berlin and commit suicide with him. Here, in this bunker, on April the 30th, Hitler names Grand Admiral Dönitz as his successor, then marries his mistress, Eva Braun. At 3.30 p.m., Eva Braun poisons herself. Hitler kills his dog and puts a bullet through his own head. two days after the death of Hitler to mop up the last square mile around the Reichstag, three divisions to take the Imperial Theater and the Gestapo headquarters. Three regiments are required for the final assault on the Reichstag where the last defenders of Berlin are resisting. There are 2,000 German soldiers left.
after two days and nights of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, two soldiers of the elite Third Army shock troops, Sergeants Mikhail Yegorov and Meloton Kantaria, run up the red flag on the dome of the Reichstag. It is 8.23 a.m. on May the 2nd, 1945. possession of Berlin. For the first time since the outbreak of war, Marshal Zhukov has a smile for the cabinet. He smiles when he sees the ruins of the Chancellery, the great gallery where Hitler lauded it amidst foreign ambassadors and believed himself to be the master of Europe. The desk where he played with the lives of millions of men. The courtyard where the bodies of Goebbels, his wife Magda and their children were found. Acting under orders, the SS had soaked them with petrol and set them alight. And the Führer. Is that him? No. His chauffeur and his cook are identified. It's not Hitler. Later, Lieutenant Klemenko finds the real bodies, unrecognizable as Hitler and Eva Braun. He disinters them and takes them in two packing cases to the Soviet High Command. What became of them? It's still a mystery. A week later, the representatives of the Supreme Allied Command join up with the Russians in Berlin to sign the unconditional surrender. Air Marshal Tedder deputizes for General Eisenhower. In fact, the Germans have already surrendered to the four powers the day before at Reims at 2.41 in the presence of senior American, French, British and Russian officers. But the Russians insist that the ceremony be repeated with them in Berlin. So, for the Germans, who tried in vain to obtain a separate surrender, there will be absolutely no doubt that the unconditional surrender includes surrender to Russia. An American plane brings Dönitz's representative, Marshal Keitel. As he reads the texts that have been sent to him, and which he is to sign at once, the former chief of Hitler's general staff loses his last illusions. To reach Zukov's headquarters at Karlshorst, one has to cross Berlin, 50 kilometers of ruin. Hitler once said, in 10 years, no one will recognize Berlin he also said, in a thousand years, people will still remember my name. He was right. In a thousand years, people will still remember this war in which 50 million died. A war which is going to end here this evening. The signing takes place in a ballroom where German officers once celebrated Nazi victories. The Allied commanders are the first to enter. Led by Marshal Zhukov, they take their places at the far end of the table. Four Allied generals. 
Germans are chosen to represent their country's final achievement in the fight against Nazi aggression. Air Marshal Tedder for Britain, Marshal Zhukov for the Soviet Union, General Spatz for the United States, and General Delatch for France. These men have been designated to witness Nazi Germany's last official act, unconditional surrender. It is now May the 9th. Field Marshal Keitel and the German delegation arrive shortly after midnight. Keitel salutes with his Marshal's baton. No one returns the salute. He remains impassive for the rest of the proceedings. Marshal Zhukov asks Keitel if he has authority to sign the act of surrender. Keitel replies that he has and asks for a delay of 24 hours. The request is denied. At a quarter past midnight, Keitel presents himself at the signing table and is handed the act of surrender. Keitel adjusts his monocle and dutifully signs the papers. The expression on his face is one of total defeat. This is the end of Hitler's Third Reich. For the second time in one generation, Germany has been completely laid low by the bitter gall of defeat. There is no pity for the servants of Hitlerism, and Keitel himself will end as a convicted war criminal. At 20 past midnight, Keitel has signed all nine copies of the Act of Surrender, and the documents are passed to the Allied generals. Zhukov, architect of the Russian victory, signs first. One after the other, the Allied generals endorse the formal end to the fighting that has ravaged Europe for six long years. The lights burn brightly in the conference room of once blacked out Berlin. The war in Europe is over. The battle you have just seen was one of the decisive battles of the Second World War, a war that affected the destinies of men and nations the world over. The film you have just witnessed was discovered in film libraries all over the world and painstakingly edited to show you the incredible impact these individual battles had on the outcome of this most devastating of wars.